Electric vehicles use chemical batteries to store energy. However, they do not all use the same type of battery. There are some differences between makes and models. Which battery chemistry is used in your EV has a slight impact on how it might behave and how you should use it. So today, let's cover off what you need to know about those differences in usage. The intent of today's video is mainly to talk about the small differences in usage of EVs and other devices using lithium batteries based on their chemistry. However, in order to talk about those differences, I need first to do an introduction to those chemistries. Don't worry though, I'm not going to go into a lot of complexity, so everyone has a chance of keeping up. Furthermore, the sections of the video have chapter markers, so skip ahead if any section isn't useful to you. At the moment, there are three main families of battery chemistry used in modern EVs. Those families are nickel, cobalt, aluminium, or NCA, nickel, manganese, cobalt, or NMC, and lithium iron phosphate, known colloquially as LFP. These are all lithium batteries, even though the names of two of them don't contain that word. The differences are mainly in the chemical composition of one of the electrodes, known as the cathode. There are several behaviours of a battery that vary based on which chemistry is used. There are trade-offs between those behaviours that we need to touch on. So I'm quickly going to talk about each chemistry and what is better and worse about each. OK, let's quickly cover off nickel, cobalt, aluminium first. NCA cells are very energy dense, so you'd expect them to be used in EVs, where energy density is very important. However, they are rare nowadays. NCA cells can degrade a bit faster than the other chemistries, so manufacturers no longer use them in EVs. We want really long-lived cars, and the NCA chemistry is a bit less able to deliver that. The next family of chemistries is nickel manganese cobalt, referred to as either NMC or sometimes NCM. The order of the letters is listed in decreasing order of the proportion of each element used, and one of the particular formulations has a bit more cobalt than manganese. However, most of the formulations use manganese and cobalt in equal proportions, so either lettering works, and I'll stick with NMC today. NMC batteries offer good energy density, certainly less than NCA, but not all that much, but they benefit from slower degradation than NCA. Those two in combination make NMC a great choice for EVs needing a lot of range, and this has been the dominant chemistry in cars for the last 10 years or so. The problem with NMC is cost. Nickel and cobalt are both fairly expensive. Furthermore, cobalt is associated with environmental and ethical concerns, and to reduce their dependence upon cobalt, manufacturers have been changing the formulation of the cathode to reduce the amount of it used. Early formulations, known as NMC111, used equal parts nickel, manganese and cobalt, but before long we were instead using NMC622, and now NMC811 is the most common formulation. The high proportion of nickel has further improved the energy density, while the reduction in cobalt significantly reduces the environmental and ethical impact, as well as reducing the cost of the battery as a whole. Even so, the use of nickel keeps them relatively expensive, and this has an impact on the cost of building a car, and hence the cost to us consumers. Reducing the purchase price makes EVs attainable for more people, and allows their market share to grow, which manufacturers are all aware is important, so they are increasingly looking for cheaper batteries. And that's where the LFP family of chemistries comes in. Lithium ion phosphate batteries don't need any of that expensive or problematic cobalt, or any nickel, and because the raw materials are cheaper, they offer an alternative for the cost-conscious consumer. Although LFP has been around a while, the lower energy density it offers was thought to be too big a problem for EVs. However, research into LFP has resulted in a boost to the energy density it can attain, to the point where they are applicable in some circumstances. Where a manufacturer can use LFP, they will, because it makes the car cheaper to make, and that increases the addressable market, in other words, the number of us who might be able to afford to buy it. However, those cars will have a bit less range than if they had NMC cells, either because a big LFP pack would be too heavy for the car in question, or too big, or a combination of both. 
So we can simplify this by saying that a car which needs more than about 200 miles of range might have to use NMC cells, whereas a car with slightly less than 200 miles of range will use LFP cells. Furthermore, as the technology continues to improve, LFP will probably become more and more common. Lots of the more cost-effective cars to have hit the new car market recently use LFP cells, including the Dacia Spring, the Leap Motor T03, the Citroen EC3 and EC3 Aircross, the Vauxhall Frontera, the standard range BYD Dolphin, the standard range MG4, the Smart Number no. 1, some of the GWM Aura 03 models, the outgoing MG ZS standard range, the Amoda E5, the lower spec Volvo EX30, and even the standard range Tesla Model 3 and Model Y. A lot of the cars already available, as you can see, as well as a couple coming soon, such as the MG S5 standard range, the BYD Dolphin Surf, the Fiat Grande Panda, and the BYD Atto 2. But this isn't solely about price. There are a couple of other beneficial side effects of using LFP cells. Firstly, the degradation of LFP batteries is somewhat lower than an MC, so the battery will long outlive the car, and the car's range will stay more consistent over its lifetime. In addition, the fire safety of LFP is even higher than it is with NMC cells, which is already very good. But there are a few downsides. As well as having lower energy density, they also charge slightly less well at colder temperatures, and are a little trickier to monitor. This last one is important for us EV owners to understand. With most battery chemistries, the voltage of the cell slowly reduces in line with the state of charge, making estimation of the state of charge reasonably straightforward. If a bit of temperature compensation is applied, the estimate of remaining charge is pretty accurate. In contrast, the voltage of an LFP cell varies very little between about 80% and 10%, so you can't easily use voltage to determine the cell state of charge. Instead, what manufacturers usually do is something called Coulomb counting. That means they measure the energy into the battery and the energy out of the battery and compare those to try to estimate the state of charge. That approach isn't perfect. If there's just a small error in those measurements, then over time those errors add up and the car can slowly lose track of its actual state of charge. That means we owners need to be a bit more sceptical of the remaining range displayed on a car with an LFP battery. Don't try to run it to within a few miles of zero. Instead, assume that it might be a bit wrong and have a bit of spare for every journey. Furthermore, it's important to fully recharge the car every once in a while, perhaps every two to four weeks or so, as once the car has fully charged, it has a better understanding of where it is in the state of charge range. Don't worry too much that this seems to be in conflict with the 80% rule. I've done a separate video about that guidance. If you don't know what that is and want to see it, I'll link to that from the end screen of this video, as well as from the description. But the reason we don't worry about that for an LFP car is twofold. Firstly, the degradation of an LFP battery is a bit slower, so it matters a bit less for this chemistry. Secondly, charging to 100% isn't a major problem anyway. What's not great is the car sitting charged to 100% for a prolonged period, but just charging it to 100% and then using it is always less of a problem anyway. Remember that all EVs should be charged to 100% occasionally. As the car does its slow charge at the top end of the battery, it balances the energy in all of the individual cells, making everything nice and healthy. But we should do it a bit more frequently in a car with LFP cells, because that process also helps the battery management system correct the state of charge estimate and get back the accuracy of its range estimation. Finally, remember that LFP cells charge more slowly when they're cold. If your car has battery preheating, then use it, either manually if that is supported, or by plotting a route to a rapid charger in the car's infotainment system if it's only automatic. Either will get the cells warm and minimise the issue. If you don't have preheating, then allow for slightly longer recharging stops when planning for journeys in the winter. 
All EVs charge slower when their batteries are cold, but LFP powered EVs especially so. Right, let me quickly summarise with a slide showing the pros and cons of each chemistry we've mentioned. NCA was used for a few EVs, but the cycle life was a bit low, so NMC is much more common for long range EVs these days. NMC offers greater cycle life than NCA and good energy density, as well as easy monitoring, but will remain on the expensive side because of the elements used in their cathode, and questionably less ethical because of the concerns over cobalt mining. LFP is the new kid on the block. It offers better cycle life still. In other words, slower degradation in real world usage, resulting in less visible range loss. LFP is cheaper than NMC, making cars more affordable. However, LFP has slightly less energy density, so your car has slightly less range in the first place. It also charges even slower than NMC in cold weather, so allow for that. Finally, the state of charge is more difficult to estimate, so we should be more sceptical of range estimates on cars with that chemistry, and charge to 100% every once in a while to give the BMS a chance to reset. One final note before I finish. Since I've shown cycle lives in the tables, I should warn you to take the cycle life of cells with a bit of a pinch of salt. It's not quite what it seems. Firstly, a cycle is running a battery from fully charged to fully discharged, which is not something we do all that often. Indeed, those of us who are sceptical of the range estimate of the car might never run it completely flat, especially as the car reserves a buffer at the top and the bottom of the battery pack. Secondly, smaller cycles increase battery lifetime non-linearly. A 50% discharge of a battery doesn't count as half a cycle. It has significantly less impact than that on the battery's health. And small cycles are common in real world use. Thirdly, and perhaps even more importantly, the number of cycles isn't even specifying the full life of the cell. It's the number before the cell's capacity is likely to have reduced to 80%. A battery with 80% of its original capacity isn't useless. The car would go less distance at that point, have less range at 100% state of charge, but it isn't broken. It doesn't grind to a halt and never work again. Therefore, don't get obsessed by the numbers in the table and start trying to count. It's not worth it. Your battery isn't going to give up after a thousand journeys, especially one built with LFP cells. Thanks very much for joining me. If you have questions or comments, then leave them in the appropriate section. I'd love to hear your thoughts in that section. Tell me, would you prefer a car with LFP cells or one using the NMC chemistry? Is the life of your car's battery still something that concerns you? If you've liked the video, then it's a big help to me if you click the thumbs up button. And I'd love to have you as a subscriber if you want to see more from me. Thanks.